Afternoon, good to be with you. It's been a fun-filled uh, couple of days, and I know we're on the anchor leg here headed uh, to uh, Bash tonight. So thank you for taking time uh, to tune in. Also for those online that will uh, be watching this session as well. My name is Paul Buffington, as the introduction said, and I'm, been, I'm coming up on seven years with Alassian. It's been an amazing journey. Uh, next month will be seven years. I love being here. I love working with customers. I'm in the solution engineering team, and I've got a, a great team of solution consultants on a weekly basis. We are meeting with customers, working with them very closely as they go on this journey around service management. Jira Service Management is the fastest growing product in Alassian's history, and remains so, and I think there's something to that around. It, it's so close to the other work in an organization. My goal for this session today, some of these things that I have been learning, um, I want to share with you I want to give you something that you can take away back to your teams that's very practical. But I'm a big advocate. I'll talk to you a little bit about technology and Jira Service Management, but I want to give you a focus in on new ways of working. So often when I talk to teams, the greatest challenge they are facing is more around practices, uh, culture, changing the way we work. So much of that we've learned out of coming out of uh, the COVID times and working remote. And so I want to share that with you and inspire you. There would have been a colleague of mine that really wanted to be here, and he was a contributor to this. Uh, actually, Anand, he came from Axelos. He's one of the authors of ITIL 4 and really inspired me. We've been doing some great collaboration behind the scenes, and we're looking forward to sharing more of this in these topics. And so let me get started and talk about where we're going. The ways that IT operation teams work has rapidly evolved. I, I'm always looking and seeing what are Gartner and Forrester picking up and seeing us. We actually saw this well ahead of this report. I'm looking forward to this future state of, of IT service management for Gartner coming up because I think we'll see some additional numbers. You probably already see this in your organization. The influence of Lean, Agile, and DevOps are changing the way that not only those teams work, but also operations and IT overall. And what I want to share with you today is kind of focus in on that. Uh, one of the things that I have always appreciated is operations teams specifically because they are just the depth of knowledge and expertise. Sometimes I've been on site and just kind of learning about what, what's going on. Tell me about your last uh, SEV1 or P1 incident and what, you know, how you not only respond and recover, but how do you learn from it? That's the other thing I love about Alassian's approach to IT service management. I come from a consulting background in the space where oftentimes we, we immediately focus in on technology, maybe process, but here we start with the team and we ask the question, who is this team? How are they working? And we, we're, we spend a lot of time on the, the one side of the chart here you see on the left hand side. What's the culture of the organization like? Where is it going? How is it evolving? And we've moved from process to practice, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes here, but it's organizational practices that enable the, the uh, teams. And then the other thing, this used to be just three items on this diagram. And over the last couple of years, we're bringing in team agility or team structure. Structure of teams is rapidly changing, especially as we've seen coming out of uh, the, you know, the pandemic and re working remote, we had to kind of change, all right, how are we going to form to work on some of these things? So I'm going to bring some of these elements in. You'll see that in it. But what I want to talk with you about, and just maybe ask you a question, if you think about your service management framework today, and everyone has one, formal or informal, very, very large enterprise organization to a, a startup, we think about, I have services I have support, what's the framework we're going to operate in? And if I ask that question, you probably are seeing some of these things that are important elements, but the, the key part is what unites them. And I, we often say, well, it would be process. Well, if we look at, in the research we were looking at and going through, and I'll focus in on one of these, but you'll find that value streams are a common uniting element across every single one of these. DevOps, you talk about the flow of work and where are and how I code faster. Safe has that built into the way that we look at it. And the one that I'm going to focus in on today is ITO4. What I've been very amazed at working with customers is the adoption rate. The customers are, are going down that path. I was working with a, a, a major bank in North America here, and their teams are already certified, and they're, they're going. And I want to talk about why is that? Being a, an ITS consultant for years, and I've heard it said, ITIL's dead, it's no longer relevant. And after those years and the reset and going back and looking at how has the industry changed? How do we embrace something that's more adaptable? It was very much influenced by DevOps and SAFE, and even IT for IT. You see value streams right there. I want to give you some ideas to maybe take back into your organization. So as a, as a high level, it is truly a new framework for modern, frame, uh, man, modern service management in the idea that one of the guiding principles is begin where you are. Take the framework and adapt it to the way that your teams are working. 
Now, in the past, it breaks away from the traditional. Previous versions of ITIL, and I think some tool vendors kind of went there, is it more, it's more about the flow of work in a cascading style. That is no longer the case. This is an adaptable model to the way that your organization is structured and work, and it looks at the flow of work within those teams in the organization. Now, the ITIL 4 practices, we, we've moved from process. Process is important, that's the workflow, maybe in a small subset, but what's the practice a team brings to working on an incident? It's the run books, it's the, it's the overall procedures and ways of working within that, and the variations of different types of incidents. We also begin with demand. What is coming at my team? What is the opportunity? What is the challenge? What is the demand? And then it's not just, hey, we delivered the service, but was it valuable? Another point I won't get to here, I'm starting to see a metric come together, some of the metrics, that we, have, we have KPIs, but they're going to put like a CX metric. What was the experience with the actual delivery and start to look at those? And it's an interesting area that's starting to evolve. But it really is looking at the service value chain right here at the middle. And what we're saying is this is a meta model for establishing different value streams within your operating model that you are very adaptable to your team. That's the other part of it that I really, really appreciate. What we're seeing from this is an improved collaboration, coordination, and the other part is learning. Continual improvement is one of those practices. So here are all the practices, and I, I also say they very, very clearly through the training, through the publications, is you start where you're at. It could be only four or five practices that my team are really, really core and key. I would pick those. You'll notice here in the groupings, continual improvement is now in the list. It's saying we should become a learning organization. And if you haven't looked at continual improvement, those coming from Lean and Agile know it very well. It is a key area of just overall organizational improvement. So we're going to come back to these as go on. I'm going to, I'm going to focus in on operations. Operations teams, I said, I've, I've worked with many uh, traveling around the world on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, meeting with them. It kind of takes me back, but I spent prior life, U.S. Coast Guard Aviation, and there were operational teams solving some really challenging situations around rescues, and you have to kind of figure it out as you go and respond. And I, even though maybe not a life is not aligned, but there's, there's the business and revenue and the impact there, and teams that come together and swarm together to solve things very, very quickly. I think this team that's on the screen here, they look a little too calm to be an operational team. But we'll, we'll go ahead and go along with that. But so the question is, what are the challenges that we're facing within your IT operations team? You probably can think, think of three to four, maybe more of that. And then looking at this team here, what are the key practices that there requires their attention, that they're focused on? One of the other trends that's in the Gartner report, but others, is the decentralization. We, we've seen that more and more, but operations is definitely living that because they're aligning to the stacks of technology that their teams, their dev teams, are delivering. So if we come back to this team here and we bring the practices back, we would probably highlight key ones that they're involved with on the operations side. Uh, knowledge and portfolio management for the portfolio of services they manage, continual improvement in there. I'm going to focus in, because I only get time for a couple here, I, I decided to pick change and incident. Every single team that I work with, it's there. Now, there's others around this that if I had time, I would love to dive into. We'll probably look at future sessions, including one around deployment management. Release management is that IT is around, and especially so much as infrastructure as code, we're, those are blending together. So there's a lot of great, fantastic guidance here. But let's come back to the framework. The service value model that we see here describes the different types of activities in here that any organization can adopt, whether you're a startup all the way to the largest of, of organizations. This model provides a way that we're going to go ahead and look at the flow of activities connecting a demand to the value creation. It is not the same journey for every type of activity that operation is supporting. It actually gives a unique gift to an organization to kind of step back and say, well, how are we working? What's the flow of work and where can we improve? Uh, and the other part of this is we're, I heard this this week of someone saying, well, we just need to get the process right so we can put it in the tool. And that's an element of it, but my question was, where does that fit into the bigger picture? Oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this in the past, I'm focused on what I'm doing here, and I need to come up to look at a bigger picture of the horizon, because a value stream will help me understand and see the horizon and say, okay, I see where things are connecting here, and especially where my stakeholders are involved. So let's, let's 
I, and I can't really dive super deep into value streams. There's a lot of great publications on this. The course that ITIL has, uh, I've talked to some folks. I haven't had a chance to take it yet. It's on my list to take this year. Uh, but I've, I have the publication, and I've been going through it, and I see so much value here. And that's the idea. I can take a value stream and follow it across. Well, value streams, they're about how a team gets work done, right? It's so, uh, being able to connect the flow and look at what's being delivered through the various practices, and we're able to focus on that. And in each step, it allows us to step back and say, who's involved? What's the input? And on the output, what's going out to the next stage, the next team as we reach across multiple teams? And inside of that are the critical conversations and discussions that we would have. I will never forget, I went to um, probably the best conference outside of team and, and summit, um, is Agile Northwest. You show up on the first uh, day of the conference and there's no agenda. It is truly an Agile conference and we create the agenda on a board. If you ever get a chance, I think they rotate between Seattle and Portland. And one of the sessions I went to was around value stream mapping from a gentleman from, I, uh, from Intel. And he told the story of how they were, some of their critical infrastructure operation processes they were mapping out. And they were in a large room. Today we can do so much in Mural and some of the other tools. But they had mapped it out around the room. And the conversations that came out of that exercise they had, and this was a multi-day exercise, was from critical connection points across the business. They started to develop. And there was one point they got to on the board. And they think, there's this bottleneck right here. Well, a couple of people didn't want to come to the session. There were something going on. They come in and like, they immediately their eyes went to, what's that right there? And we're like, well, this is where you, this is coming into your team and we want to help you improve that. So I think this exercise of going through this, I was talking to another consultant re recently. It was moving a team off a more traditional tool into your source management. He says, we've only taken on one to two value streams in phase one. Late, he's bringing over the other practices and they'll, they'll revisit those. So it's not that you're going to map everything out. But there's a lot of value that we can help teams see the bigger picture in connecting this. So I want to take two of these. I'm going to go with change enablement. And we're going to go ahead and look at how can I improve the lead time or overall infrastructure change. Some teams I talk to, their lead time's great, and others it's a month or two, depending on what's going on. And also, Maybe the flow is really bottlenecked in different types of changes I manage. So the idea is, what's the demand? Is it, is it maintenance changes coming in? Or is it an ask from the business that it's going to be a major upgrade? We're going to go ahead and move this off into the cloud, or we're going to change this cloud configuration so the business can move into this part of the industry. So what is the demand? In there is the engagement. What does that engagement look like Everything being engaged? A customer I was talking to yesterday, they have business analysts out working with the different business units that are running this engagement. Another customer a couple weeks ago in the um, sporting industry, they actually have a demand that's coming in through their portal. So again, we're looking at each one of these as this model, the 3D model, we're understanding where the flow is going to go. We move over to plan. Let's take the upgrade or the move to the new technology. Is it a collaborative planning, or is it simply, hey, I'm going to fill this out, I'm going to pass this document around? We know Confluence is great, and I see a lot of teams adopting it there, and we've got some great examples that we've actually included in, I think, the, the change template now being in Confluence. So what's the planning look like? Who's involved? Where are the challenges there? And then we finally move on to what we're actually going to design and transition. Now, if this was more software focus, maybe we're building something. My whole point in walking you through this is, as we build this out and map this out, we're starting to find where are the challenges, where are the opportunities for improvement that maybe the lead time is really slow around deliver and support because my cab, I'm, I'm still centralized. There's a great publication from Gene Kim's group, the uh, IT Revolutions, gentleman that has actually advocated and removed cab completely from the way they work because of their compliance being distributed and they're able to be more advisory. And so they've gone to a services ownership approval in their, cha in their changes going out. And so it's, they've saved significant time. So we finally deliver that out. And I think the last part is we're delivering the value. We're measuring it, but it doesn't stop there. We're coming back and in every one of these like 90 days, like one customer said, we're doing a retrospective look back on major changes to find out where we can improve the delivery and the quality it was it delivered, but where can we improve as a team in the way we work? So let's look at a couple examples here. 
So we'll come back to our team and we're going to take on standard changes. That's the bulk of a work within IT operations or an IT team. And I'll also briefly touch on the software changes at the end here because we're seeing a lot of that. And we'll, a normal change, I, I had it on there, I won't get time for it, so we'll go ahead and keep moving. So um, this is the flow of work. We're going to lay it out linear and some of the details. This is an example. This doesn't cover everything. But what I want to look at is standard changes. Those are, I'm the DBA, I'm the systems administrator, and I have to do this maintenance change. They're low risk, regular changes, but they need to go into the system. Most of the time, say, can you go log that in that tool? And they're like, ah, oh, it's going to take me some time. How can we streamline that? So here's some examples that we have seen in Jira Service Management. The one is most common. I, I work with a customer that they were coming off of ServiceNow. They had 130 plus standard changes in their library. But they manage these, a lot of templates around that. So when we got into this and we followed up to them, they are actually using the portal as the interface. That means it's easy for me to come in and log this. I have pre-authorized applications that are there for maintenance, as well as what are the pre-authorized maintenance actions. This list will grow over time as we review. Maybe some will come out because they're higher risk now and they need further oversight. Or in his case, there are a few in here based on some questions he asked, he might flag it for not a cab approval, but just a review. Now what's driving this for them is they've taken this into Insight. We have a schema here called practice standards. Insight is great for data-driven models. And they have in here not only what I'm going to authorize, who might get a review on it, what are the documentation that goes into the change plan for when the change window opens. So the end result is it does a look up here, it says, yep, pre-authorized, we'll just notify the service owner. Automation rule picks this up. It may very well check some things. It'll update the change ticket, check the change window, and I'm excited because the change calendar will have the freeze window soon, so we'll say, hey, you're inside or outside. And we send back to them saying, yep, green light, waiting implementation here, lets them know about their change window opening. And in the case of this one customer, they send a notification back saying, hey, we need you to do your close down with your notes. Or in this case, we could assign the change ticket to them and we template it because we have the tasks in here already filled out. For them, it was 100 some odd, and I think that is grown today. One customer in Europe, they had this challenge, they were coming off with another, uh, another more legacy tool. They took 70% of their change workload on standard that's now on these automated rails, making it easier. Now their team can focus on that 30% of work, breaking that down of those normal changes. They're really, their, their IT projects, their collaboration with other teams. The last part is the learning. Looking at the metrics and saying, okay, how are we doing? That's pretty good. We've seen most of everything moving through standard and in some organizations that might flip that around where our normal is heavier process, longer lead time. I'm excited about what Elastian Analytics will bring, what it'll start to unlock in some of the insights. I didn't have a chance to get in there, it's in our environment today, I just didn't have time to add a screenshot. I think that's gonna have unlock some of those aha moments after we look back over the last 30 days. My whole point here is retrospectives are not only for major incidents, they're for the overall change delivery, um, change enablement practice as well. Last one I wanna mention in this area, and that is around delivery of code. I've spent a lot of time since Jira Service Management launched, I think we're coming up three years ago, and I'm always delighted and thrilled when more traditional IT organizations that are moving to a digital world, they get so excited about this because that is a challenge. I, devs over here, and we kind of run audits, we have to go pull it out of that system for compliance. There are a lot of different use cases here that are really, really helpful. Now you've seen this that we talked about and we're continuing to build upon this where the, Jira Automation is powering this risk assessment, very adaptable. I've talked to a few customers that have deployed this, and they've got multiple rules around different types of code that are pushing, and everything that's green light is moving through, and then those that are higher risk based on service, assessment there, they're just gonna be notified. Uh, the, the one team I was talking to, they had to play swivel chair between, I think they were in a, another ITSM vendor, and they'd have to go over, put in a ticket, they'd come back, they weren't integrated. And so this was a game changer in that I don't even have to leave my development tool. I've pushed this code out. I know who's work, uh, looking at it. I can look at the ticket in there. And it's automatically going to allow this pipeline to move on as soon as that service owner has reviewed it 
or multiple owners, we could take the cabin here if you want, you can figure the approval how you want, and they can move on and they're notified when that unlocks and the code is moving towards the environment. So that's just a brief highlight on this one. This is a really, really important one that I'm seeing uh, an increasing interest and also adoption of the code aspect. I think it helps in two ways. Visibility during an outage of the code changes and compliance and auditing. I can go back and pull these reports into my reports, especially when we have Elastian Analytics being able to pull that data. All right, so the remaining time that I have I want to shift on the other side. We've pushed all these great changes out into our production environments, new capability and value that we've shipped to the business, and yet we still can, we can have those incidents, things that are just happening, or even if we've planned and something happens through there. And so how do we get better as a team, as an organization, responding to low-level incidents to major outages? And so a value stream here, and I think this is the key part, the demand for this will enter in in multiple different areas. We know the alerts aspect, but you know, what source of alert, what type of platform? So there's, at the demand part, we wanna kinda of start to ask that. Or the demand could be coming from someone in the business is seeing performance issues, and they're reporting it, and we're gonna go ahead and uh, escalate that up because we believe that this is something that could be very well a major incident, or on its way to that, we wanna get ahead of it. So they come from multiple ways. It's the next step that I'm gonna spend time focus on, the engage. How do we get the right teams involved as fast as possible to resolve or start the recovery of that incident? We then move on to deliver and support, which then very well could go back to obtain and build because we need new code to push out. That's the great thing of being on one platform. Ultimately, what we're doing is we're able to then go ahead and transition that out and we recover the service and hopefully back in time that that value has not been disrupted for that long for the business. The last part is very important, I'm gonna spend time, so my two areas are gonna be the engage and the improve. Most of the time, teams, we don't go back and look and do that, look back, where can we improve and learn, I'm gonna spend some time there. So when we think about our operations team, they're definitely too calm when we're thinking about an incident here, but we're gonna look at major incident practices, what do we need to address, and so I'll look at that, especially about team, getting the right teams involved, swarming, we'll talk about. And then we're gonna talk about something that's really important practice outside of the technology post-incident reviews for a blameless post-mortem. So let's take a look at that and let's get going here. Again, mapping it out in a value stream, very well be putting it out into a mural, a board, and we'll start to see the areas we want to work on. Continual improvement, you always will find areas to pick up and, and improve upon. It's that, what's, what's the first one, and then build upon that as we move along. So what I want to do here is, I think I got a duplicate slide is talk about the engage aspect. That major incident is happening. It's occurring for that team. Now we gotta go and find the right team, and this still happens on a regular basis. This model has been around since I think the 1980s that we're gonna go ahead and go to tier one. They're gonna, let's say user reported, may not even be a major incident, and they're gonna say, all right, who do I get this to? What is it related to? Now, automation and some of the tools we have today are great, or if I have some sort of a source on the alert side, but it's the, you know, like the user reported, how would he get there? So this model is not very efficient because then we're gonna up to the expert, and now we're gonna go down to the developers and bring them in. So this, this clock is ticking and going on. So the whole idea is how do we flatten that model? The interesting thing in that report from Gartner that I cited at the very beginning, they also noticed another trend and they've, they've cited twice now in their report, cloud has changed the way we work. It has flattened the world. They call it level Z support. It is coming in both in operations teams as well as service support teams. And so what we're able to do is change this. And now another area I would highly recommend is look at the Consortium for Service Innovation. They have published a lot around swarming models and how to adapt and evolve. The old way, we know it well, I see a lot of you shaking your heads, probably have been stuck somewhere in that tier, very siloed, it's directed, it's pre and there's it, the escalation process really, we intended to be good with it and for the right thing, but it really slows things down. Whereas the emerging model is about network. I can opt in, I know what's going on. It's emergent and loopy in the process and the way it works, but here's the part of it, it is collaborative, and it's also about the value creation. We're gonna measure how we're doing as a team and get better about this. So here's the things that we've, we've observed. Modern practices are about team alignment. 
team alignment around products and services. Also the automation, where can I bring automation in here to save time for my team? Going back and doing a 30 day retro around incidents, maybe we're lower level ones, where can I apply automation to better classify, better um, route or prioritize? We're gonna focus in on a little bit around chat ops, and then finally the last part, continue learning, which will close this out. So Jira Service Management, we acquired Opsgenie several years back. We have now moved forward to where that is all a part of the overall platform, what we deliver with Jira Service Management. What we see here for an operations team, and what I love about this compared to uh, my previous days in consulting is, I can optimize an environment around that team and the type of support they deliver. So I, hear, I, I see the on-call rotations for different types of teams, for different types of services. So we see here the Platform team, these are these services that they support. Immediately, and I, teams that have struggled, like how do we get the service alignment? You, if you go through and survey your organization, they can probably cite these are the top 25 to 50 services, business level services to technical. Now you have the ability to start even immediately getting alignment around that capability. That also now brings in which dev team's involved, where are the changes coming from, and here, who are the on-call teams that I can immediately bring in? De operations and development teams. We also can bring in the integrations that are very specific. 200 plus integrations in OpsGenie, but this team here is only focused on alert sources from these four. On the other side, when I get a user reported incident that they classify that service, it's going to be routed to that team. So I'm covering both the alert and user reported incidents, getting to the right teams more of, or, or faster and more efficiently. And when that does happen, back to that major incident, instead of escalating through, it's now here. We've, we've clicked this up to a major incident because what we found, and we see a few things happening. First of all, in the middle, we see the service. The service, well, let me go, the responders. How do we get the responders here? It did a lookup based on service, and it says these are the teams involved, and it brought in the platform team, and the network support team, because they're both involved in some shared services. The other side of this is the actual service itself. So what we see here is two services involved, and one of them, hey, you already got some incidents going on. What's coming here soon is that we're able to quickly add those in, or I can add automation. This is the AI ML of smarts of our platform. It's helping me understand very, very quickly as I jump into this incident, I have more context, or I was like, where does this connect and where does this run? I'm able to go ahead and open up Insight and look at the infrastructure that is connected to it and get to the appropriate application or system. What did they change recently? So a lot of really rich data immediately to the teams that are most focused on this. The other part of this is going to, and I won't show this as the run book, we see a lot of teams using Confluence where they publish their runbooks or they're using Jira forms and they're bringing it as a checkbox. They are able to put the runbook right with the team immediately in the response. The last part is the swarming. Because of the chat or the conference integration, I don't even have to leave, in this case, Slack, um, because that's where my team works. We have a great integration and, and MS team, or Microsoft Teams is going to, is there, but it's gonna even get better with what the teams are doing. I'm able to spend my time responding to that. So it's a back to that swarm and we flatten the model. I'm, I'm responding where I'm at. I'm able to jump in and say, yep, I think we did something with the database. Let me check the database logs. And I'm able to help hopefully recover this incident quickly. Now there's a lot more here. For sake of time, I won't be able to jump into. But I do wanna come back into investigation phase where we're, when I'm in the investigation, I'm able to go ahead and open up the CICD part of it. So this is where connecting your CICDC pipeline to this, I know what did the dev team push last night. I see something that was failed. That's right, that was related to this database patch. And I can also bring that back in as a redeployment or have the dev team look at that. So I think that's the part of this of bringing them onto the same page that's really critical. Or this is the dev team, they're already looking at it and recovering from it. The last part of this in the recovery is this part. This is from Google. Google, this is about a year old study the last time I saw it, and I think it's still the case. 70% of the reasons or the reviews of incidents are forgotten. Why is that? Well, most of all is I, I document it in some fields and someone runs a report, I hope, 
And what we're an advocate for is to move towards blameless postmortems that are collaborative, bring teams together so we can learn and improve, especially in one organization, they do this level of detail for all P1s and P2s. We do that in Atlassian. And so that means that I can come in, learn and improve, document not only what I'm going to improve in capability, this kind of becomes a replacement for problem management in some ways. I had a friend joke recently, he had like 9,000 tickets in his problem backlog, and he said that's where, that's where tickets go to die, because that no one was clearing out the problem backlog. And it's because problem isn't focused on what's most valuable. Here you can focus it on things that you can affect and improve you know, immediately to the business in that value stream that we talked about earlier. So the key part of this that we've actually added is we can take the recover and we're able to bring in a PIR ticket. Now, something that we're, we're leveraging, you can use the problem investigation if the teams have that, but the PRR ticket is a starting point. We have other capability we will bring around this that we can start to have the JIRA ticket track. How are they doing on the postmortem? What did they learn? What did we sh push out for software code? I can now pull that back into my metrics. And we do that internally in Atlassian. I've seen dashboards where completed PIRs versus those that have stalled. And that's a great point is, you know, a leader coming back and maybe doing a retro with the team saying, What's going on here? What can we do to get better in this area? Again, it's about unlocking valuable insights for service improvement across the teams. So an example, we do have a PIR template in Confluence, so that's a great place to collaborate. We might as well take that out into Confluence and we can collaborate around the timeline and everything that we have learned. And so we see the result of that from an example here. So let me summarize and I'll get to Q&A. And I've only touched on two practices. Value, ma value stream mapping for all of these practices are very, very important, but it's a learning journey. I highly encourage you to take a look at that. Maybe there's one specific flow of work that is the greatest challenge. That might be the place to start and then build upon that. Um, there's all kinds of practice innovations at a team level. I think the biggest thing is to advocate for becoming learning teams instead of, you know, we would just we're moving on to the next thing of stopping and asking the question about where can we improve, how can we build upon this? And then there's all kinds of metrics that the teams can use, and we've published a lot. Of, published a lot of, two guides. This one here is more from an ITIL standpoint. Still, I think it's one of the top downloads. It takes, if we were a high velocity team, which practices would we adopt and embrace and bring in? So it gives you some idea and some inspiration. And then we took that guide and we said, okay, we're gonna go ahead and implement this with Elasian products. This takes those practices and gives some guides and some checklists there. So thank you for your time.